At the heart of the prevailing liberal vision of race today is the notion of racism, a concept with multiple, elusive, and sometimes mutually contradictory meanings. Sometimes the term refers simply to any adverse opinion about any racially different group, whether a minority in a given society or a group that may be a majority in some other society. This immediately transforms any adverse judgment of any aspect of a different racial group into an indictment of whoever expressed that adverse judgment, without any need to assess the evidence or analysis behind it. In short, this approach joins the long list of arguments without arguments. At other times, the term racism refers more specifically to an adverse conclusion based on a belief that the genetic endowment of a particular racial group limits their potential. Other meanings include a preference for advancing the interests of one race over another, with or without any genetic theories or even any adverse assessment of the behavior, performance, or potential of the group to be disfavored. For example, an argument has been made in various countries around the world for policies preferring one group over another on the ground that the group to be discriminated against is too formidable for others to compete against on even terms. This argument has been made in Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Malaysia, in India's states of Assam and Andhra Pradesh, and even in early 20th century America where Japanese immigrants were feared on grounds that their high capability and lower standard of living would permit them to undercut the prices charged by white American farmers, workers, or commercial business owners. In other words, racism defined as a preference for one race over another need not depend upon any belief that the group to be discriminated against is inferior in performance or potential and at various times and places, has been based on the opposite belief, that the group that is to be discriminated against was too proficient for others to compete with on equal terms, for whatever reason. As a book advocating group preferences for Malays in Malaysia put it, whatever the Malays could do, the Chinese could do better and more cheaply. A leader in a campaign for preferential policies in India's state of Andhra Pradesh said, are we not entitled to jobs just because we are not as qualified? In Nigeria, an advocate of group representation policies deplored what he called the tyranny of skills. Racism not only has varying definitions, its role in arguments by intellectuals can vary greatly from its use simply as a descriptive term to its role as a causal explanation. How one chooses to characterize adverse decisions against a particular racial group may be a matter of personal semantic preferences, but to assert a causal role is to enter the realm of evidence and verification, even if the assertion contains neither. For example, a New York Times editorial presented a classic example of the liberal vision of racism. Every index of misery continues to show that the devastating effects of racism linger on in America. Blacks make up a disproportionate number of the citizens dependent on public assistance. The unemployment rates among black males and teenagers remain at least twice as high as among whites. The proportion of blacks dropping out of the labor force altogether has doubled over the last two decades. The bare facts cited are undoubtedly true, but two of the three facts, higher unemployment and lower labor force participation among blacks than among whites, are worse today than in earlier times. By the logic of this editorial, that would imply that there was less racism in the past, which no one believes. Black labor force participation rates were higher than that of whites generations ago. Black unemployment rates were lower than that of whites in 1890 and, for the last time, in 1930. Black 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds had a slightly lower unemployment rate than white youngsters of the same age in 1948 and only slightly higher unemployment rates than their white peers in 1949. Moreover, these unemployment rates for black teenagers were a fraction of what they would become in later times. These low unemployment rates existed just before the minimum wage law was amended in 1950 to catch up with the inflation of the 1940s, which had, for all practical purposes, repealed the minimum wage law.
since inflated wages for even unskilled labor were usually well above the minimum wage level specified when the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed in 1938. The key role of federal minimum wage laws can be seen in the fact that black teenage unemployment, even in the recession year of 1949, was a fraction of what it would become in even prosperous later years after the series of minimum wage escalations that began in 1950. The last year in which black unemployment was lower than white unemployment, 1930, was also the last year in which there was no federal minimum wage law. The Davis-Bacon Act of 1931 was openly advocated by some members of Congress on grounds that it would stop black construction workers from taking jobs from white construction workers by working for less than the union wages of white workers. Nor was the use of minimum wage laws to deliberately price competing workers out of the labor market unique to the Davis-Bacon Act or to the United States. Similar arguments were made in Canada in the 1920s, where the object was to price Japanese immigrants out of the labor market, and in South Africa in the era of apartheid, to price non-whites out of the labor market. Any group whose labor is less in demand, whether for lack of skills or for other reasons, is disproportionately priced out of labor markets when there are minimum wage laws, which are usually established in disregard of differences in skills or experience. It has not been uncommon in Western Europe, for example, for young people to have unemployment rates above 20%. The point here is not to claim that pricing competitors out of the market was the motivation of all or most of the supporters of the Fair Labor Standards Act. The point is that this was its effect, regardless of the intentions. In short, the empirical evidence is far more consistent with the changing patterns of black labor force participation rates and unemployment rates over time being results of minimum wage laws than with changes in the degree of racism in American society. Indeed, these patterns over time are completely inconsistent with the fact that racism was worse in the earlier period. Only the fact that the intelligentsia tend to make racism the default setting for explaining adverse conditions among blacks enables such statements as those in the New York Times editorial to pass muster without the slightest demand for either evidence or analysis. It is much the same story when racism is used as an explanation for the existence of black ghettos. If racism is simply a characterization, there may be others who prefer different characterizations, but these are matters of subjective preferences. However, if a causal proposition is being advanced, then it is subject to empirical verification, like other causal propositions. When racism is offered as a causal explanation, as distinguished from a characterization, that makes the predispositions of whites the reason for the residential segregation of blacks among other forms of racially disparate treatment. But seeing that as a hypothesis to be tested brings us face to face with inconvenient but inescapable facts of history. For example, most blacks were not residentially segregated in such cities as New York, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and Washington by the end of the 19th century, even though they had been before and would be again in the 20th century. Do the racial predispositions of white people just come and go unpredictably? That would be an especially strange thing for predispositions to do, even if reasoned opinions change with changing circumstances. It is a matter of historical record that there were in fact changing circumstances preceding changing racial policies in the United States, both when these were changes for the better and when they were changes for the worse. Moreover, where the circumstances changed at different times from one place to another, racial attitudes and policies also changed correspondingly at different times.